You are listening to the For Flourishing Sake podcast by Frederica Roberts. Welcome to episode 48. This is the second of the extended podcast episodes over the next few weeks, where you will be able to listen to the replays of the For Flourishing Sake book launch events. Today, I bring you the second half of the first panel discussion of the book launch extravaganza. This panel was recorded live on the 18th of June, the day the Kindle edition of the For Flourishing Sake book was published. The panel was chaired by Adele Bates, Education and Behaviour Specialist from the UK, and featured the following panellists. Fabian de Fabiani, Assistant Head Teacher at Townley Grammar School and Director of Character at the Odyssey Trust for Education. Fabian is also a policy advisor for Ofsted, which is the UK government's schools inspection body in England, and he's a keynote speaker. Rebecca Camisio is a school psychologist at New Canaan Country School in Connecticut, USA. Rhiannon McGee is head of positive education at Geelong Grammar School in Australia. And Elke Paul is a positive education consultant, professional development expert and well-being conference organiser with IPEN, the International Positive Education Network. Elke is based in Germany. In this second half of the panel discussion, the panellists continue to explore the how of positive education. Listen over the next half hour or so as they discuss the importance of putting teacher well-being first and of having a shared language for well-being in schools. Topics such as the role of appreciative inquiry processes and teacher-led action research were also touched upon to support empowering staff and creating lasting change. The issue of cost was also discussed. And finally, the panellists addressed the role of positive education in the context of COVID-19 and the Black Lives Matter movement. As always, you will find all the relevant links, so the links to all the panellists' Twitter handles and the link to the page where you can watch back all the panel video recordings on this episode's page on the ForFlourishingSake.com website. So moving over to Elka, I'd like to ask you, I know specifically you are interested in looking at when embedding positive education, the role of teachers first before actually we get to the pupils. Would you be able to tell us a bit more about that, please? Yeah, I think the in-depth experience I had with that, I was I was uh, a consultant, an in-house consultant for two years in a, at an international school here in Berlin. And um, I was given the great freedom to actually teach or workshop uh, the entire staff of the school, which was um, first very disruptive for the school because teachers had to be, or staff members had to be taken out of um, classes to be with me for three days. And so we staggered that throughout the year. But what, what I found, and we had actually an, an external evaluator looking at that, what I found was that it created a social bond that the school didn't have before because we had um, staff members and teachers coming from different areas of the school to, together. We created a very diverse mix. So let's say um, a gardener would speak to, um, to the um, primary principal and workshop with that person for three days. And what that created was um, a plateau or a pause at understanding or well-being understanding, a language that they all could share. And that, that actually created a vessel then to say, now we know what we are talking about if we're talking about well-being. So how can we make this ours? And I think Fabian has talked about that um, a couple of times saying, you know, it needs to be integrated into, into the values of each school. And I totally agree. But for me, it's very, very important to make the teacher the central or the staff members the central agents of that process. And I support strongly, um, for example, appreciative inquiry processes where you actually drive, uh, become the driver and change agent at, at a very democratic level so that we then create together a strength-based approach of how education can actually look in our school. Um, and that for me is the biggest game changer that I noticed so far, and that inspired me to actually work more on the topic of how to engage teachers onto that journey. Thank you. Fred, I would like to move over to you, maybe just to um, ask a similar question about anything different that you've seen in terms of embedding positive education, but also as a second part to your question, I'm sitting here, I work in a school, I work, I'm a head, I'm a local authority, I'm getting interested, and of course my next question is the cost. And I wonder whether you could address that one for us as well. 
Um, okay, so what was the first part of the question again? Sorry. No, no that's okay. Um, so just looking at this, how have you seen, because I know you work in lots of different schools and you work internationally as well. Are there any other things that you've seen as, as how-tos that people can embed positive education within their education environments? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I see, of course, being an external consultant that goes in and delivers training is that, that a number of schools that really embrace positive and character education are bringing in people like me um, to either deliver um, training to the children directly. So uh, a bit like, um, you know, at Geelong um, and um, at how Rhiannon was saying about actually giving lessons on positive psychology, but what some schools are doing is rather than having it built into the curriculum, they're bringing people in externally to deliver some of that training um, and also deliver training with uh, staff as well. Um, so whether that's done in house as it is at Geelong or whether it's done, um, you know, and as it was at Elka's former school as well, or whether it's done uh, through external consultants uh, that just come in from time to time. The other thing that I've seen that's been a really interesting development in the UK in the last sort of 18 months or so is I've started working with a number of um, academy trusts. So uh, for, for those who are not in the UK, an academy trust in the UK is basically state funded, but independently run for the most part. And it tends to be uh, quite often a number of schools that get together under a trust um, with a common purpose and, and overall leadership. Um, and I've started working with a number of these academy trusts on um, bringing action research into schools. So really empowering the staff um, and, and as part of that, overcoming the objections, you know, to, to actually give the staff the control over let's try things out, but try them out in a methodical way, in a research driven way. So they're actually um, getting some training from, from me to, into what character education, and positive education is, and some of the interventions that they can look at as well, but also the bigger picture. And then they try things out within their own setting and they, they document that as well. And I think that's a really interesting development. And I'd like to see a lot more of that, of, of um, that research happening directly in schools, because a lot of what's been happening in terms of the development of this from a research perspective has come out of academia. And if you take it from academia and then say to schools, here you go, here's something we've researched and it worked brilliantly in that school when we did it under control conditions, but you know, um, we now want you to put that into your school. The ideal way to do that is for those schools to go, well, that sounds really great. Let's try this out on a small scale in our setting and see how it works and whether we can tweak it and what might work in our setting. And I think that's a, a really exciting part of that. And uh, what was the second part of the question? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so the second part no, it's was- me. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> the second part was, OK, I'm sitting here. I'm interested. I'm excited. I can see the positivities in this. Ha ha. Pun intended. Uh, what are the costs? The costs. Well, that's an interesting one because it's actually one that probably some of our panellists might be um, better of answering. And I think Fabian particularly out of this panel talked about it a bit in, in the book. So I might defer that one to him in a minute. It's, it's interesting because I think on one hand, we have seen that the development of positive education and a lot of the work does seem to be disproportionately happening in high-end um, exclusive independent schools. Um, and, and that can be a concern. And it's certainly a concern, I think, for all of us, regardless of what setting we work in, that we want to see it in more schools and in all settings. And what I tried to do with the book is to actually show that all sorts of schools, even schools with tiny budgets, um, can actually make this happen. And I think uh, schools that really value um, bringing flourishing to the forefront of what they're doing in this kind of context are finding creative ways of, of making it happen without it having to cost the earth. Um, and, and that's where maybe I'll, I'll defer to, to Fabian in a moment. But what I've also seen is that um, a number of people, and, and one of them being uh, Dan Morrow, who uh, is the CEO of the Woodland Academy Trust, who will be on the panel on the 21st of August. And also the other one that springs to mind that's made similar points was um, Patrick Otley O'Connor, who's an executive head teacher that goes into different schools um, when, when they need particular support and is also a coach to, to many, many head teachers in this country, um, that they've actually uh, given examples in the book uh, of um, ways that by bringing in positive education, 
they've actually saved an awful lot of money. And it comes down to a lot of that being the staff well-being issue um, that uh, we, we suffer all over the world from massive staff attrition due to the, the, the terrible well-being of staff in education. Um, and that actually when you bring in positive education practices and you make them systemic and you make sure that staff are well, then you retain your staff and you save massive amounts of money in, in, in terms of those recruitment and training costs of bringing new staff. So actually, although there might be a cost initially, it's more than recouped that way. But uh, I know, Fabian, you're in a school that's, um, that's a state-funded school. It's part of an academy trust. And I know that you've talked quite a bit in my book about that. So if I may, Adele, can I hand that yeah, over to Fabian yeah. if he wants to add something? Oh. You're muted, Fabian. So I think in terms of costs, it fundamentally comes down to choices and what is the school willing to spend the money on. Now, obviously, we're a state funded school. We have we have budgets that we need to stick to and so on. I think it's it's a bit of a false narrative to say that this will cost X amount of money for schools to say we can't do it with costs. And I think that is sometimes an excuse on different ed teachers parts, different schools and also for teachers to say, Oh, you know, we don't have the time. Sometimes there's kind of there's the cost analysis, then the time analysis, and some people say we don't have time to do this. As Frederica was saying, in terms of the uh, staff training and well-being, I think if you put you spend X amount of money on on staff well-being, actually you will see that then staff retention improves, enhances. I I mean, within our school, our you know our staff retention is really. Uh, improved there was never an issue but we've seen kind of marginal gains there well-being as well in terms of uh, the health and well-being of staff so i think you recoup costs that way but it is down to choices and you know cpd learning more isn't you know, there's always a slight cost to that but i think especially now that character education is on the offset framework there could be a risk that there will be you know really kind of uh, new organisations coming out there saying, we're going to be able to help you develop character education with one CPD session, and we'll give you this tool. Now, that's not going to work. I think the really great thing about the work Frederica's been doing, and actually the history between Fred's and, and kind of our school, is that actually we've just kind of, we've met, we've come together at different CPD events, and we've shared best practice. And I think if, you know, we can create more of a learning community based on positive education and character education, then there's kind of a greater element of knowing the, the individual, the organisation, trusting, and then saying, yeah, actually, that cost will be well spent. I think within the state sector in schools, there's a tendency for head teachers and CEOs, unfortunately, in, in different kind of areas to want a quick fix and to think they'll buy in X month. That's not the approach to have. If you're committing to developing positive education and character education, it's at least a two to three year plan. And it isn't anyone offering you a quick fix isn't really the real deal. And you know, I might kind of be speaking a bit a bit too outspoken with that, but I think it's important it's it's important that you generate kind of a, a greater sense of trust and you look into people's credentials and you realise that actually when it comes to school, it's down to a choice. There are always going to be costs with everything and it's worth what you value as a school and what you really do, you know, nurture. And Fred's done such wonderful work in, in so many different schools and with kind of a long-term rapport there and a long-term uh, education relationship. It's not just a case of kind of super people coming in and transforming it with one CBD. There needs to be a kind of a long-term plan. And, yeah, Thank we're you, Fabian. Yeah. Thank oh, you. So, <laughs> um, so I, I really like Fabian's given us a really good tip there. Look out for the people who are going to go, oh, here's a CBD and let's do it in one afternoon. And um, that, that's really not how positive education works. And I am going to swiftly move on to the last question because I want to finish on time. But Rebecca has just given us a note here saying schools should ask themselves about the cost not to do this work, which I think is a wonderful way of looking at it. So thank you, Rebecca. So moving on to the final question. I I think it would be uh, silly of us not to be talking about all these these wonderful benefits of positive education and not putting it in the very real here and now situation that we're in. So I'm talking about COVID, I'm talking about lockdown, I'm talking about the massive movement for Black Lives Matter. And I'm going to open this up to the floor. 
Um, and bearing in mind, if you could keep your answers uh, down to just a, a minute or so that we do finish on time. But how do you see positive education being useful or positive when such ginormous things are happening in the world and with our pupils and our teachers and, and everyone within the school community? Is there someone who would like to kick us off with that? I can't see anyone. <laughs> Rebecca, lovely. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you. I, I think that it even prior to the pandemic, um, we saw the rise of mental health, mental health challenges um, among our young people um, all over the world. And I know in the United States that um, for the first time ever, uh, adolescents reported feeling more stress than their parents. And that's so um so on us as adults. And I, and I think, you know, the situ situation with uh, shelter in place and um, remote learning and um, all of the horrible um, news uh, lately about um, in police brutality in the United States has just exacerbated existing mental health vulnerabilities. And um, so I think that, you know, had, had we been doing more of this work all along, um, we would be in a better place to, as I said before, address some of the inequities. Um, so that I know that wasn't short and I could probably go on, but I will um, hand it off to someone else. Is there anyone else who wants to pick up on uh, Rebecca's points? Yeah, Fabian? So just briefly, yeah, I think with COVID and also with, uh, you know, the murder of George Floyd and, and Black Lives Matter, I think especially within UK schools, we're thinking of the recovery curriculum. And I think positive education, in particular, in terms of well-being and trauma, is really at the forefront now in terms of forming that recovery curriculum and trying to heal some of that trauma. And just to kind of to reiterate that, if you think about, you know, governments and so on, with all these lockdowns, what's actually been important to note is that when the question was between health and wealth, you know, the lockdowns came in in the majority of you know the, the world's governments, and we, we valued health and well-being above GDP. And I think that can only kind of encourage us and reaffirm what we're doing. Lovely, thank you, Fabian. Um, and so as we uh, bow out as we as we start to wrap up. I would just like the panelists to think if there's any final thoughts or uh, any pieces about positive education that you think you didn't get off your chest, um, especially how to's. I think it's been really useful in this panel today, listening to people um, explain how they've invited this work into their their different scenarios. And I can also. Um, reiterate as well, because I've read some of the book, uh, that Fred's really good at doing this. She does really give us lots of examples of this is how it works in a very small setting with a very, very small budget. Um, and then to the opposite as well in, in different settings, but it is all in the book. So I do recommend that. So um, going to final thoughts from the panel. Uh, Rhiannon, are you okay to start? Uh, sure. I think that you know, this experience um, this evening for me has just reminded me about the um, value of connecting with other schools who are on the journey, both in your own country and beyond. And any time I've had the opportunity to do that, um, especially when you are a leader um, in your own school, sometimes it can feel a bit lonely if you're at the early stages. I think it's just really helpful um, to learn from each other, to keep an open mind and to know that we haven't got, you know, we, we, we're endeavouring to do the best we can by our young people, but there's still a lot of work we need to do around measurement. Um, so we need to help each other out in that way too to make sure that we are definitely doing the best we can by our kids. Yeah, I, I, I would like to add on to that. I think um, I think it's, it's, it's important to encourage our teachers who often feel left alone and um, say that the, the leadership is not really looking after their well-being and, and the numbers um, are equally dire for teacher well-being as they are for, for kids' well-being. So I, I do think we should all have the alarm bells ringing. And I do encourage um, teachers to really um, seek out these information about positive education. And even if you're the only one in your school, you can do it for your own sake first, because if, if you help yourself first that uh, to be at a more balanced place, 
um, that is already a huge help to all the students you work with. And 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 again, I I, I agree that we should really network much better together um, to, so to create a bigger and better movement um, and we should get louder. That's what I really think. We need to get louder uh, and get, get out of the niche market. Um, and the last thing I would say is um, keep going and be very self-critical about it. Lovely. Thank you, Elke. And I must say, just echoing from that, that if people want to get involved in the community of talking about this, uh, Frederica also has a podcast. Is that right, Fred? And you introduced lots of yes. different <laughs> Sorry, I had to so... unmute myself. Uh, yes, <laughs> it's called the For Flourishing Sake podcast as well. So, um, yeah, and I'm always looking for more contributors. A few of the books contributors have already take, uh, participated in there, but um it's it's a great platform to share uh, our learning sharing. as educators. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, who else do we want our final thoughts from? I can't see my screen again. Please, could we have the all screen thing? <laughs> Thank you. OK, so uh, Rebecca, what are your final thoughts? Um, sure. I, I think that um, it's, it's so important to consider the adults. I, and I completely agree. And I think that we, in terms of well-being and a related concept is resilience. And we know a little bit about what, what can help, uh, con having connections, um, having um, effect. Uh, this word is really difficult for me all the time. Um, efficacy. So for teachers feeling like they um, are successful at their role, that, that they know, have what they need in order to be effective teachers, that's something we can measure and support teachers with. We can measure burnout. We can measure um, lots of things that can support teacher well-being. And maybe if we can start there in this crucial moment for us, we're, we're thinking about re-entry and um, we want to make sure that the adults are well in order that they can support the, the students to be well when we get back together um, in late August or September. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca, which is really echoing what Elka said, the importance of us helping ourselves first. And I loved what you said, um, Elka, about us even if it's only you that you can help in your school to start with, nobody's on board, you can still start with mm -hmm. this work and this approach, mm -hmm. which I think is, is what the panel's echoing. Fabienne, have you got any final thoughts before we pass back to uh, Frederica? Yeah, just really quickly uh, echoing what everyone has said, and in particular within, if you're in a school setting where kind of character and positive education isn't on the kind of agenda, but you do really want to develop it, just kind of how about resilience? and have our creativity just to keep kind of pushing for it because, you know, sooner or later this one is universal now in UK schools, but kind of this, this element of particularly the combination of well-being and character, positive education. I think that is really where the future is in education. So just keep banging that drum and uh, start with find this book. <laughs> uh, lovely. Thank you, Fabian. So thank you very much to all our panel. And talking of banging drums, uh, I think we better pass back over to our author of the hour, Frederica Roberts. Thank you so much, Adele. And thank you so much for that brilliant, brilliant chairing of a discussion that I'm sure we could have actually gone on for hours uh, because we're all so passionate about the topic. But um, the hour is up and uh, um, I need to at some point go and have some lunch and uh, Rihanna needs to go and get some sleep and Becca needs to get to school, etc. And, and Fabian probably needs to get back to, to lessons. Um, but um, I just wanted to really um, bring my own final thoughts to this, which is um, there's so much to unpack and there's so much going on in the world at the moment. And, and you're right to have asked that as a final question. You know, what do we do in, in terms of everything that's happening with Black Lives Matter, with COVID, etc., and, and the, the big picture with, uh, with positive education and how that fits? And a lot has already been said by the other panellists on this. But the one thing that I would like to add to that is that from the very beginning, even though it was perhaps not initially articulated quite so well, but it's certainly been articulated since in the positive psychology movement and then within positive education and certainly within character education and everything that's written and talked about there, there's something very crucial there, which Fabian talked about earlier on, which is about um, sort of the, the citizenship aspects of that. And positive education and well-being is never just about the individual. It's about societal well-being, societal flourishing, and um, civic duties, and, and being responsible, decent human beings and citizens. And so more than ever, 
this stuff is absolutely crucial because if we look at what's happening even just with COVID, you know, we are relying on being responsible citizens in terms of res respecting lockdown, in terms of um, not just thinking about whether we might be personally affected, but, uh, you know, the example of, of the wearing masks, for example, that actually does nothing for you, but people wear masks in various countries to protect other people in case they're asymptomatic as they're walking into shops and into public transport, etc. And if we're looking at the the, the this, you know, the, the, the horrible picture that we've been seeing in terms of uh, what's been happening that's led, thank goodness, to the big resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement and the demonstrations all over the world, despite the, the lockdown situations, is that actually that um, the idea that we can educate children to, to be citizens that care and that um, that want to actually um, develop the well-being of those around them is really crucial. Um, so I think there's more need for, for what we are all doing and talking about than, than ever. So um, we will be back uh, with a different panel today to talk about some of the same topics, some different topics all around positive education and character education um, later on today. Um, so at 5 p.m. UK time, um, I'll be back with Flora Barton, oh. Kelly Hannigan, Patrick Otley O'Connor and Rebecca Teague. So that will be a mostly UK based panel, but absolutely fantastic panelists uh, with different settings, different experiences um, to, to really bring uh, this discussion to life again and bring the how to life. And then at seven o'clock, we're back with an international panel again. So again, seven o'clock UK time, BST we're on at the moment. We'll have Sirdar Ferret. Um, I'll have to check with him whether I'm pronouncing his name right. Probably not. Uh, Ian Flintoff, Julie Goldstein and Katrina Mankani. So we'll have panellists from um, UK, Finland, um, the USA again, Connecticut and um, also from Dubai. Um, so if you can't join us live for any of those, depending what time it is in the world where you are, then all of the panels, including this one, so you can share the link and share it with other people that couldn't watch it that you think might find it interesting. Uh, all the panels will be on the For Flourishing Sake com website on the landing page where all the information was about the panels for the day um, and also on YouTube and Facebook where you've been watching live and uh, potentially being able to ask questions as well. And of course, remember to buy your copy. It's there at the bottom of For Flourishing Sake. If you get the Kindle version, which is out today, then you've got it straight away and you can read so much more about the how as well. And once you've read it, I would like to ask you a really big favour because um, there are so many books out there and uh, without reviews it's very difficult for the books to get seen so once you've read it and um, even if you didn't like all of it you know it's not all about five star reviews I mean I hope you will love it but um, it's about honest reviews so if you, once you've read it leave me an honest review on Amazon please um, so uh, please get those reviews coming in they're really really valuable so thank you very much um, and all that remains for me to say I'll bring the panel back as I do this is um, a huge, huge thank you from the bottom of my heart. I think I'll go and have a little happy cry before I go to the next panel this afternoon. Thank you so, so much um, to all of you. Thank you, Elke. I'll go down the screen as I see you, uh, Elke. And um, thank you very much, Becca and Rhiannon and Fabian, for the fantastic input, uh, not just into the panel, but into the book as well, and for giving your time so, so generously to share your experience and your knowledge. And a massive thank you to Adele for sharing this panel today uh, on what I know is a massively busy day for you. So thank you so, so much. You've done a fantastic job. And thank you to all of you for watching as well. And um, I've seen lots of tweets and Annie Poole particularly, who will be on uh, on a later panel with us as well as contributors. She's been tweeting like mad. So look out on Twitter for all the uh, at Flourishing Ed hashtags and, and share what she's been sharing. Um, she's been finding all those tweetables you were mentioning, Adele, and, and tweeting them out. So thank you very much. And thank you to everybody who's been watching. Uh, join us at five o'clock UK time and at seven o'clock UK time if you can. But for now, bye-bye from all of us. Thank you for tuning in to the For Flourishing Sake podcast. If you found this episode useful, please give it a five-star rating on iTunes to help it reach more people and please spread the word. Also, if you haven't already, remember to subscribe so you'll never miss an episode. For Flourishing Sake is available on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts and Deezer. 
The book by the same name came out on Kindle on the 18th of June and will be out on paperback on the 21st of August. You'll find it on all the major online book retailer sites. It's jam-packed with evidence-based strategies for whole school positive education with case study examples from a wide range of schools from around the world. So why not order your Kindle copy now or pre-order your paperback so you'll receive it as soon as it's published? If you'd like to get in touch with questions or comments or to contribute to a future episode, please contact me via Twitter at Flourishing Ed. You can also leave comments on individual episode pages on the forflourishingsake.com website. I look forward to hearing from you. And until next time, for flourishing sake, have a great week. Mm -hmm.